The title for this morning's message is The Ministry of the Law, Part 2. And the text comes to us from Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 13. So I want to read those verses so they're fresh on our minds. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. See, the first part of Romans chapter 7, Paul had finished a discussion about the law's authority. Right? How long are we bound by the law? And he told us that the law was in effect until a man is dead. Right? As long as a man is alive and lives, the law is in effect. And death then separates us from the obligation to the law. And he used that illustration of marriage to show how death frees from the law. And he tells us Christians that we have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. right Through his sacrifice on the cross, we can become dead to the law, no longer joined or under that law as responsibility that we're then allowed to be married to another in verse 4, he says. And who are we then married to or joined with? To Him, to Christ, who was raised from the dead, that we then should bear fruit to God. And He also indicated that the law stirred up passion, the passions of sin in us. But when you think about it, as we said last week, where does the problem lie? Is the problem with the law or the lawbreaker. Whose fault is it? Is it the law's fault or is it the lawbreaker's fault? Lawbreaker, right? Biblical term, sinner. Right? That's what we would call a lawbreaker. So is the problem with the law or the sinner? When we started looking last week, we saw definitely it's the sinner's fault. There's nothing wrong with the law. See, and Paul understood that and he knew that his readers might find fault with, with the law. So he starts to embark now upon an explanation to, to vindicate the law. And Paul, again, anticipates questions that his readers, or even us today, would, would come up with in our minds as we're reading. Right? They may say, Paul, Paul, I know that you said the law does not hold sway over us any longer. And, and I know that we serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So what good is the law? What good is the law of my life that no longer has dominion over me? Or, Paul, doesn't your teaching turn the law into sin? So in our text, Paul it starts by asking a question. And really he's asking, is there something wrong with the law? And last week we started looking at the ministry of the law. And we had four point outline. And that was the law reveals sin. The law arouses sin. The law kills. And finally the law shows the sinfulness of sin. It's a point Paul's going to make. And we got through the first point and a half before the time ran out last week. So what I want to do is review that first point. The law reveals sin, verse 7. 
It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Paul says, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So here's that big question. Is the law sin? Is the law missing the mark? Is the law somehow in error? Remember, this was the third of four major questions that that Paul had asked since the start of chapter 6. And we looked at last week, why would a thought like that even enter into somebody's mind? And we said, well, if you kind of misinterpreted verse 5, which says, for, for when we are in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Right? Those passions of sin, he says, were, they were aroused by the law. They were awakened by the law. So the conclusion of son them is, well, because sin takes advantage of the law, then it appears that the law is guilty and the law is sin. And Paul's answer to that is, God forbid, certainly not. That is not the case. And here he says, on the contrary. On the contrary. The law, he says, actually points out sin. Right? He says, I would not have known sin except through the law. And what he's saying is sin is the culprit. Remember, we looked at the true character of the law is in verse 12. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. See, and Paul gives that example then. Right? He gives a particular example in verse 7. He says, For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. Right? He says, I would not have been conscious of covetousness. Covetousness meaning earnest desire or lust or an irregular desire. He said, I would not have known that unless the law said you, thou shalt not covet. Or covet means to, to set your heart upon, desire, to long for. We pointed out last week, notice that Paul does not use murder, stealing, lying, adultery to drive home his point here. He chooses what we would consider the last of the Ten Commandments, covetousness. Right? Thou shalt not covet. And we pointed out last week that it differs from all the others because it's an inward attitude, not an outward expression, an outward action. Why would Paul use covetousness? Well, as one commentator said, covetousness is an insidious sin that most people never recognize in their own lives, but God's law reveals it. Most people don't even know they're coveting. Having evil desires, unless the law tells you you should not have those evil desires. So the first ministry of the law then, as we looked at last week, was it reveals sin. And then we started to look at the second point, law, the law arouses sin in verses 8 and 9. It says, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. We'll review verse 8 quick because we kind of looked at that one at the end of last week. But sin, he says, took opportunity by the commandment. That word taking could be translated as seizing, to seize. So think of it, to grab hold of. It, taking opportunity or occasion, basically a, a starting point or a base of operations. So it's seized onto it to start something as a starting point. See, the law, like we said, does arouse sin, wrongdoing, if you will. Right? That's what he says in verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, sinful passions 
which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Right? We hear something that says don't do it, and inherently what do we want to do? Do it, right? Any kid. Tell them not to do something, not to touch something. No, turn around and touch it right away. Even some of us adults still have problems with that. Amen, right? When we looked at last week the fact that human nature despises the law. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And that word enmity means hostile to or an adversary of. So the carnal mind, our, our natural mind, is an adversary of God. So what we're fighting in our natural mind is against God in His revealed Word, His law. And it says because it's not subject to the law of God, right? our carnal mind is not subordinate to or placed under the authority of. So human nature despises the law. It's actually an adversary. But Paul tells us that the law is good. It's the flesh that's at fault. Right? Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. He had to send His own Son to conquer sin and death. And Paul then tells about sin's impact upon himself in verse 8. He says, It produced in me all manner of evil desire. Notice all manner, right? How much is all? It's all. And different kinds of evil desires within him. That from the inside, right? That evil desire, that, that covetousness. If you think about it, Paul saw himself as a devout Pharisee who was committed to obeying every aspect of the law. And he says, but when it said, thou shalt not covet, I saw that I had all kinds of evil desire within me. And Paul talks then about when the law fails to impress the soul, when the law does not have its effect on the person's soul the way it should. Because he says, for apart from the law, sin is dead. See, for without the law, he says, sin was dead. Or that word apart from means alien from or without. And he said, sin is dead. See, death, the word used in the Greek there, is, really means a separation. So death is separation. Death means that it cannot be affected by external stimuli or that it's dormant. So what Paul is not saying is that sin has no existence apart from the law, but that sin is dead in the sense that it is somewhat dormant and fully active, but it doesn't overwhelm like it does when the law becomes known. See, if the conscience, right, if our conscience, our mind is not aware of the law, then sin appears to be dormant ineffectual we don't see sin because we don't know about it we don't see it see the ignorant person of the law would would see himself as just or good well i'm a good person notice i didn't say sin was not present only that the person would not see himself as being sinful he would see himself as being without sin and that really then helps us to, to explain verse 9. When Paul addresses what happens when the law impresses the soul. He says, For I was, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He says, For I was alive without the law once. 
Basically what he's saying is the law did not have an impression on him. It did not impress him. Thus he concluded that sin was dead. See, he thought he had real life. He thought that he had spiritual life. See, Paul here is talking about the absence of a a viable impact of the law upon his soul. He's saying the law really had no viable impact on my soul, on my being. He said, really what this is, the time before the law is really brought to bear upon his conscience. See, when Jews are 12 years old. They go through a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah, right? So basically, 12 years old, the boys literally become sons of the law at that age. And from that point of the age, they consider themselves responsible and they have to go through the rest of their life checking boxes. Did I keep it? Did I keep it? Did I keep it? Think about Paul. If you could turn to Philippians chapter 3. See, Paul is saying that he thought he had life as a righteous Pharisee. He thought that was life. See, as a Pharisee, he was impeccable. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. He goes, Though... I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So what he's saying is, look, from my birth, I'm the poster boy of Judaism. There is none better than me. Look at that. Right? Concerning the law, a Pharisee, man, I kept every little point of that law. Even the extra ones that were heaped on by the rabbis, we did that too. And then he said, you know what, zeal? You want to know how much I love my law and love my religion? enough to persecute the church and go after them. And then he says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, which he'll later say there is no righteousness in the law. But he was blameless. He had checked every box off. But it wasn't until later, though, that he saw his guilt. That he saw that it wasn't just the outside, it was the inside. What did Jesus, what did he say about the Pharisees, right? They were just whitewashed tombs, right? It looked great on the outside, but what was on the inside? Dead man's bones. Paul is saying that here. I thought I was alive. I looked alive. But his heart was not right he says i was alive once without the law but when the commandment came sin revived and i died paul says when the commandment came sin revived i died revived basically it came to life again recovered activity if you will so the commandment coming would be the law that's coming to bear upon the conscience you think about that when the law when you see the law for what it truly is when it bears upon the conscience you finally see your true condition you finally see who you truly are see sin was not as dead as he thought it was because it was rampant on the inside he just finally recognized the presence and the power of sin in his life. That's the point we all have to come to. We may say we're good. We may say I got it. 
But we have to come to that point where we realize that I'm dead on the inside. I cannot keep that law. I never will be able to keep it. That's what he means, sin revived. It came out of its dormant status. It became active, effective in his life. It became, I like the term, recognizable. Sin became recognizable in his life. Right There was a time in his life where the law was not revealed to him in such a way as to show sin. It was just outward actions. But he's not saying that the sin wasn't there. He just said he couldn't see it. You know why? Because he wasn't looking for it. He wasn't allowing the law to do its work. He thought he had life. He thought he could keep the law. But finally, that commandment hits home, he says. It hits home to his soul. And what happens? He sees his sin. He sees his inability to truly keep the law. And he recognizes that he is dead in his trespasses and sins. Therefore, as he says, he died. See, he knew he could not fulfill the law's requirements. And therefore, he stands under the sentence of death from the law. So the law arouses sin. And it really leads us into our next point that the law kills, verses 10 and 11. He says, In the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. See, Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could give life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. What he's saying is the law does not give life. He's saying that the law shows the sinner that he is guilty and condemned. And that he needs a Savior. That's what it shows. See, the true assessment of the law, verse 10, he says, and, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. See, Paul's conclusion was that the commandment, which was found in the law, the commandment which he thought was supposed to be giving him life, was found to actually bring death. See, he recognized finally that his hopes of eternal life by keeping the law were gone. That he was under the sentence of death. And then he says, what is the real culprit? Sin. Look at verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So sin is the real culprit. Sin deceived him regarding the commandment. It twisted. Sin, he said, was indeed present within me. And that's what brought death to him via the law. So what was to blame for what had happened to him? What is Paul saying? What was to blame that happened to me? It was sin, not the law. See, sin, he says, had taken advantage of the commandment. What does he mean by that? It means it deceived him and then killed him. See, it brought home to him his sinfulness. It then encouraged him then to sin even more. See, the problem with sin, it only satisfies for a season. And it only satisfies for so long before it has to increase in intensity. So it encouraged him to sin even more. 
as he sought to deal with it. But it finally made him recognize that his disobedience could not just be put aside and ignored any longer. He realized that he could not fulfill the law. What's great is in chapter 8, we get to see the good news. The good news in chapter 8. Turn ahead a little bit. We'll do a little preview because you may think this is a downer of a message. But this is where all people have to get to and realize that they cannot on their own achieve perfection of the law. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. God knowing that we could not do that, sent His only Son to become sin so that we could have victory. I don't know about anything greater than that. Verse 10 of Romans 8, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Can't wait to get there and study those. But Paul tells us another ministry of the law, and that is that the law shows the sinfulness of sin. Look at verses 12 and 13 of Romans chapter 7. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. What I wrote in my notes right there, chapter 12, you know what Paul is saying right there? The law is vindicated. The law is not the problem. The law is holy. The commandment is holy and just and good. See, this is the answer to that question way back in verse 7. That question that was asked by Paul, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not, because it is holy. And the commandment is holy and just and good. See, that's what we have here in verse 12 is the, the proper position of the law. If you could, find your way to Psalm 19. See, in Psalm 19, David exalted God's law. And not just by exalting God's law, he exalts God. That's what we have to remember. Paul here, by telling us that the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. What does that say about the law giver? That he is the same. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. 
See, the law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes are right. The testimony is sure. The commandment is pure. So Paul, here now back in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, like David, recognizes that the law is holy. The commandment, right, the teaching, was holy and just and good. See, they are from God and are instruments of God set apart for His holy purpose. That's what he's saying here. The law, the commandments. They're holy because they're from God. And they're His instruments that are set apart for His purposes. That's why they're both righteous and good. See, it was not the law that was to blame for man's sins, Paul's saying. The law had simply revealed them for what they were, didn't they? And that's why he explains the law and sin in verse 13. When he says, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. See, this is the last of the four questions that we talked about. And it started way back in chapter 6, verse 1, that first question. Paul had asked that the ends justify the means when he says, so shall we sin that grace may abound? Remember his answer to there? God forbid, certainly not. And the reason he told us was by way of a rhetorical question. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Then in verse 15 of chapter 6, he asked, Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, what was his reply to that? God forbid, certainly not. And the reason again is followed by a rhetorical question. It says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? And then in verse 7, what shall we say then is the law sin? What was his answer there? Certainly not, because on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. And now the question here, did, did that good thing, the law, did it enter in to bring forth death? So what then, has then what is good become death to me? Right, he's saying the law is indeed good. But then it, he's going to say on the surface it seems like the law is appointed to bring forth death. And what's Paul's answer? It's the same as those other three questions. God forbid, certainly not. And then he goes on to say what the purpose of the law's legal entrance is. Why the law? He said so that sin would be manifested as sinful. That it might appear sin, he says. He's saying sin is exposed by the law. Right, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, the law is there so that sin would be revealed as the culprit which brings forth death. The law is there to show you that sin's actually bringing forth the death. What's the wages of sin? Death. That's why he says that sin that, that was working death in me. Sin exploits the law. He exploits, sin exploits that which is good. And what he's saying is sin is more horrible than first thought of. 
so that look at so that sin might become exceedingly sinful exceedingly sinful so that you would see sin as not just a oops i made a little mistake it's exceedingly sinful i have violated my god's will i have chosen to set myself up and know better than my god that's what sin is saying that's why it's exceedingly sinful One commentator says the law exposes sin's absolute hideousness. I like that. The law exposes sin's absolute hideousness. So Paul asked, does this mean that what was good has brought about death in me? You know what he says? Absolutely not. By no means, right? He says it's not the law which had done it, but sin. Sin, that it might be shown to be what it was, had worked death in him through that which was good. It distorted that which was good. And what the commandment, he said, had done then was revealed to him the awful sinfulness of sin. And it made it even more sinful by arousing human passions so that he would sin even more. But the commandment itself was good, even though it was being misused by his sinful nature. Think about this. If the law shows the sinfulness of sin, You know what else it shows? It shows that God, the lawgiver, is holy. He is holy, He is just, and He is good. But it also shows that we need a Savior. That we cannot. That we cannot attain it by ourselves. The first song we sang today, as we were singing it, I wrote some notes in here. We sang, for you are good to me. For you are good. For you are good. You are good to me. And then at the end, I cry out. I cry out for your hand of mercy to heal me. I just want to close by reading John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. God's mercy. His hand of mercy that heals us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for these words of Paul. The problem is not with You. It's not with Your commandments. It's not with your law. It's with our sinful nature. The problem is sin. Until we come to that place where the law shows us the sinfulness of sin in our hearts and that we have no way out except to die to self and repent and believe in Your only begotten Son. Until we get to that point, Lord, sin will continue to have its way. I pray that we would continue to take up our cross daily and follow You. 
but that we wouldn't be afraid to preach the full Gospel, the good news. That the world is still full of sinners who need a Savior. And we, like Paul, we have the good news. May we go out and say to all who will listen, come and see. Lord, we thank You. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.